welcome everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Today, we are thrilled, lucky, fortunate to present photo conceptual artist Hank Willis Thomas. Yeah. Hank was supposed to be here in November, so we're even more happy and thankful to have him here today, um, that he was able to reschedule and be with us. Uh, I want to thank our partners for their support of today's program, the Cranbrook Art Museum and the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and our series partner, WUOM Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Currently on view at the Cranbrook Art Muse Museum, if you haven't seen it yet, is a large-scale video installation called The Truth Is, I Hear You. This is a project by the Cause Collective. Uh, this is an artist collaborative which is co-founded by our speaker, uh, Hank Willis Thomas. Uh, the exhibition results from a two-week tour of the Cause Collective's Truth Booth throughout Detroit and Flint, which happened last summer. Uh, and today, the museum is here, and they are graciously passing out free tickets as you leave the theater today. They have free tickets for you, good for any day you want to go and take in the exhibit between now and when the show closes on March 19th. And if perchance you set your plans up to go to see the show next Tuesday, January 31st, uh, there's going to be a special screening uh, at that evening by PBS Art 21, a documentary uh, about the uh, performance series and exhibition that the museum did last year with Nick Cave. Uh, and that's going to take place at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. That's going to be followed by a conversation between Art 21 executive director and the curator, Laura Mott. So that might be a good day to go. I have one announcement for you today and one fun fact before we get started. Today, exactly... 180 years ago, January 26, 1837, Michigan became the 26th state admitted to the Union. Yeah, President Jackson signed the bill establishing its statehood, and I thought perhaps this was a notable marker of history as the University of Michigan uh, is in the throes of celebrating its bicentennial. I hadn't realized that U of M actually started before Michigan was a state. Uh, and that, of course, uh, this, the, the, the university was first founded in Detroit, but then also 180 years ago in 1837, Ann Arbor had made a bid to be the state capital and lost the bid to be the state capital when it became a state, but it won its bid to be the home of the University of Michigan. So, fun fact in history. One more announcement, delectricity. Delectricity. I left some uh, postcards out front uh, with calendars. Delectricity is Detroit's nighttime festival of light based art and technology. And its next edition is going to take place next September when Woodward at Midtown will be transformed by site specific installations of light based art, including video, sculpture, performance, interactive design, and more. And they have just opened their call for entries, and they need you. Art and design folks in the audience, from lasers to animation, robots to 3D video mapping, they challenge you to show Detroit and the world what you can do. So they have an open call for entries. The deadline is February the 28th. If you have more questions, they just happen to have an information session happening at MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Detroit, this Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, and otherwise, you can find them online at delectricity.com. We will have our regular Q&A today following Hank's presentation here in the screening room, out the doors to the left, down the hallway, you'll find another theater. And we'll meet you there after. And now for a proper introduction of our guest today, please join me in welcoming the curator of contemporary art and design at the Cranbrook Art Museum and the 2016 Warhol Curatorial Fellow, Laura Mott. Thank you, Christina. It's an honor to be here to introduce an artist I respect very much, Hank Willis Thomas. I will begin with some highlights from his bio that demonstrate his impressive reach as an artist. Um, he has exhibited extensively throughout the United States and abroad, including the Public Art Fund, the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Cleveland Museum of Art, amongst others. His work is in numerous public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. His 2008 monograph, Pitch Blackness, won the first ever Aperture West Book Prize. 
and he's a member of the Public Design Commission for the City of New York City, and he is represented by Jack Shaman Gallery in New York City and Goodman Gallery in South Africa. Hank has also implemented numerous public projects, which is how we were introduced. I first met Hank almost a decade ago through artist Ryan Lexiev in San Francisco. And this was a few years after Hank had completed an MFA in photography and an MA in visual uh, criticism from the California College of Arts. They had recently formed a collaborative with other artists, designers, and ethnographers called the Cause Collective, which was focused on innovative projects in public space. And this was the summer of 2008, during the first presidential campaign of Barack Obama. And this was a moment where an introspective questions on representation were being aimed at the highest office in our, in our country. Ryan and Hank shared their idea for a video recording studio called The Truth Booth, which filmed responses to the prompt, The Truth Is, and I helped to partially fund the prototype. Since then, the project has traveled extensively to South Africa, Ireland, Afghanistan, and went on an American tour during the 2016 election year. So early last year, between stops as we traveled around Detroit and Flint to site the Truth Booth, Hank was on the phone making negotiations for his most recent collaboration platform, Four Freedoms, the very first artist-run super PAC. Once again, his practice was drawing out the urgent questions of our present moment, including structures of motive, the role of art in our government, collective binaries versus the individual, and the deep divisions in American culture. For Hank to ask a question is a call to action. So before Hank comes on to give his lecture, The Truth Is I Love You, we're going to show a trailer for the exhibition at Cranbrook Art Museum titled The Truth Is I Hear You. One night, just we're talking about it, and we said maybe we should go for a journey uh, to find the truth. And uh, it evolved, and then we said, yes, a truth booth. It's a giant inflatable speech bubble that's traveling the world, recording two minute truths. Um, we asked the public to finish the sentence, the truth is being this kind of invitation to invite conversation and invite exchange, but also to invite listening. Some are just absolutely heartfelt. Some are quirky and spontaneous. Some are about love. It's like the range is amazing. You never know what you're going to get. I think that's the beauty of it. There seems to be a need for people to go in there. It's really fundamental. It's that thing that we're taught as children, but then spend the rest of our lives unlearning that you can't judge a book by its cover and you can't really tell uh, what's going on inside anyone's head or in their heart. Giving them an opportunity to express themselves in an unjudged environment. Just stepping aside into this kind of context-free space, and I think there's some sense of like you know absence or purity or something. You know, people are talking to themselves in a way. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hank. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I wanted to do, uh, ask you a favor. Um, how many people have smartphones? Raise your hand. Oh, good. How many people are on social media? Raise your hand. How many people are not? How many people don't want to be? OK. <laughs> so keep track of those people. But the rest of you guys, I want to ask to take a photograph with me 
Okay, so can you bring your phones out? And if, remember, the people who said they didn't want to be photographed, except for, I guess, some of their face will be small in my picture. Um, but I want us to take a picture at the same time. Um, and I want us to post it and to hashtag it. I don't know what we should hashtag it, but uh, how about either penny stamps or the truth is I love you? Which one? Okay. The truth is I love you. Okay. All right. So is everyone ready? Um, and I'm, I think, a Hank, at Hank Willis Thomas. And uh, so, all right. This light is bright. <laughs> ah, that's better. Okay, thank you. All right, you guys ready? All right, one, two, three. Oh, that's good. Oh, wait, I meant to ask you to take a picture of the person next to you so you can say, <laughs> yes, unless that person is not or does not want to be on social media. <laughs> this is how an artist makes work, right? I guess. All right, you guys ready? One more time. One, two, three. Cool. Um, what we just did just now, um, as we're posting, is we created a version of a history. Oh no, I still can't see. Um, and what I think is so fascinating about creating history is that is really up to us. History is about uh, the moments we choose to remember or the moments we choose to share. And the real power in that is that we have the option and the power to actually make history in the stories that we tell. And I think that's a central theme to my work and it's something I learned, I think, before I was even uh, born. So you can turn it down now and thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a, a clip from an excerpt from a, a recent five channel video installation uh, where it features the voice and some images of James Baldwin. So if we can cut these lights out right now. It seems to me that the artist struggle for his integrity must be considered as a metaphor for the struggle which is universal and daily of all human beings on the face of this terrifying globe to get to become human beings. What we might get at this evening if we are lucky, if the mic doesn't fail, if my voice holds out, if you ask me questions, is what the importance of this effort is. Now, when you were starting out as a writer, you were a black, impoverished, homosexual. You must have said to yourself, gee, how disadvantaged can I get? Oh, no, I thought I hit the jackpot. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> it was so outrageous, you could not go any further, you know. It had to be, it, so you had to find a way to use it. <laughs> James Baldwin, who are you? First of all, I'm speaking as an American citizen. I'm speaking as, also as the grandson of a slave. My mother was born in Maryland. My father was born in New Orleans. I was born in New York. Someone who represents a very complex country, which insists on being simple-minded. So um, that's, to me, all of the things I've been thinking a lot about. And that's just the first few minutes of that piece. But when Baldwin says the artist's struggle for their integrity should be considered as a struggle for all human beings to get to become human beings, what it makes me think about is how my work is really about me trying to figure out how to be a better person. And I guess doing it in public uh, if people choose to care. And also this idea of taking the many complex and diverse elements of our own um, experience and making something out of it, even if people think of it as a disadvantage. And I also am really very much thinking about this idea of our country uh, being so complex and insisting on being simple-minded. Uh, I think a lot about these issues when I show a naked picture of my mom, which is always the best way to start a lecture. Uh, I don't think I've ever done that before. Um, but she was an artist, an art student at uh, 
at Philadelphia College of Art. And no, this was at Pratt when I, and she, they, at the time, women weren't really supposed to be artists. Photography wasn't really art. And um, so one of her professors told her that she was just taking the place of a good man because she's seen, he's seen people like her before and she was just gonna graduate and get pregnant and never really make art seriously. And uh, that stuck with her, it stung her. Um, and so she made this piece a few years ago where it says a woman taking a place, taking the space from a good man. Uh, you took the space uh, from a good man. And she says, I made space for a good man, which is like, you know, it's my mom, so she had to say that. Um, <laughs> but I really think about that idea of um, what people tell you about yourself and how you, what you do with that. And I think a lot about that when I think about her as this young girl with these aspirations um, and her curiosity in photography, photography being one of the, you know, very uh, often used arguments for truth. And uh, that when she was studying photography, no one had anything to say about uh, the history of African Americans in photography. And they didn't really know much. So as any good professor would do, they gave her an individual studies assignment. And uh, she proposed this independent research project, uh, Black's Contribution from, to Photography, 1840 to 1940. And she says, I've found no standard art history that refers to any Afro-American artist. References have led me to more references, which are scanty. I've written 50 letters to possible resources and have had enthusiastic feedback by receiving letters, extending invitations to visit. And she lists about 11 photographers. Um, and one, I, th I found this just kind of in a box uh, not too long ago. And it reminded me of uh, an, one, uh, something one of my collaborators, Chris Johnson, said is that every artist is essentially trying to answer one question. And I think about um, my mother was really trying to figure out where are these stories that, where are the images of people that she knows? And where is the, what is the other uh, version of history or African American experience? And how can that be shown through photography? And so that research project led her um, along the way I came along, I guess. <laughs> and then it led her to produce her first book, Black Photographers, 1840-1940, a biobibliography. And thinking about African-American photographers in 1840, which is 25 years before the emancipation, and knowing that to make a photograph in 1840, you would have to know exceeding uh, an incredible amount about physics, about chemistry, about mechanics, you had to have means, you had to be curious, and that forces us to rethink what it means to be meant to be black in the 19th century, because we're so often told um, these universal narratives that don't always uh, complicate things. And that book led to the next book, which led to the next book, and another 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 book, <laughs> and another book, and another book, and another book, and another book, and among others. Um, and I would like to call myself her best book. Um, but really, that's what you guys need to think about when someone gives you an independent study project. You might be doing that with the rest of your life. <laughs> and then your kids might have to deal with it. <laughs> um, and so this is a piece that we did together called Sometimes I See Myself in You, because I never wanted to be an artist. I never either really cared. All of my mother's friends were broke. I was like, that's not going to be me. Um, and somehow I had nothing, I had no other <laughs> ideas. And so I wound up following in her footstep unwittingly until I was like 30. I was like, wait a minute, am I just doing what my mom was doing? <laughs> um, and so I made this piece with her called Sometimes I See Myself in You because um, I actually, three years after I graduated from NYU, my mother became the chair of the photo pro program at NYU. So um, I like to say I paved the way for her. Um, so, so my work is really very much um, um, about kind of the, what I've learned from both of my parents, but which is really about like what it means to create a story, to take control of narratives and thinking about how framing, I looked at my earliest photographs from high school and thinking about how I was always, my question is about how does whoever's holding the frame affect the story? And I started looking at every photograph that I took and I realized there were frames within frames. And then I started to think about what, 
messages am I, are being left out when I, when I think about framing. And so I started to ask my peers when I was in undergrad to actually take pictures with me. And I'd make frames and then I'd take a photograph of them and I tried to make something interesting go on outside of the frame to think about the manipulation of photography. And it was really also very much about chance, about all the things that had to go right to make a moment like this happen where my mother's wearing this red hat, this woman's wearing this red hat, she's walking down a busy street in New York looking into a dark restaurant at the 15th of a second that I pressed the shutter. And we are trained in photo school to actually try to derive meaning often from photographs, but there is so much about chance. And thinking about how, um, what gets left out of the frame when we present things, I think a lot about, I take a lot of my inspiration from popular culture, and this is a movie called Head of State with one of my favorite lines. Our American children's futures are at stake here. Now I say we need to study this issue and appropriate legislation that will return us to an America that we can be proud of. God bless America and no place else. And I think about that everywhere I go, every time I hear God bless America, because that's really what it means, right? That we ha in order to be a patriot, we have to hope that everyone's doing worse than us. Um, and I think a lot about this as we become a, a, a newer America every moment, but in this moment. And uh, one of the clips that we got from the Truth Booth tour of the Detroit uh, area was this. The Muslims that are so-called terrorists are not Muslims. Please believe me, I am a Muslim myself. The Muslims are kind and nice people. They are giving and they pray to, to God five times a day. The same God that you have, the same God Jewish people have, the same God Christians have. We're, we're all the same. We don't need to hate. This is a free country and we, and we should be good um, and it's profound for me to see such a young person countering the narrative that they've been taught by society and it frightens me that he feels that need um, because I didn't have to think so critically when I was a little kid but I also am inspired by the way in which um, he's taking this opportunity to actually talk about something that he takes seriously and not taking for granted the stories that are told about him or other people that he sees may be similar to him, which is apparently all of us. <laughs> um, and I think about this idea of we the people as patriots, you know, that in a society that imprisons more people than anyone else in the world, that we call ourselves the land of the free. And uh, so I started making these quilts um, that are mazes that are also text-based and thinking a lot about kind of the criminal justice system or just freedom in America and how for so many people there is this incredible uh, path that you have to navigate. And I think about that in relationship to other parts of the world where we've seen extreme um, uh, examples of people overcoming struggle. I think about South Africa, and I met an artist there named Nicholas Flobo, and he said that we need to live in tomorrow before we get there, because that way you, don't, you won't be surprised when you get there. Um, he said that the challenge with South Africa post-apartheid was that people weren't living in the freedom that they wanted, so when it it happened, they didn't know what to do with it. And I thought that was pretty amazing. What does it mean to live in the tomorrow that I want to live in? You know, how does that, what will that look like? I think this is a time to be visionary and not reactionary. And I want to be, I want to know, I want to feel comfortable with my choices today. And the best way to do that is to imagine um, who, where I want to be tomorrow. But someone challenged him as an artist about um, how, how do we all get on the same page? you know, for the struggle, et cetera. And he said, it's up to me whether I choose to sell out or be a comrade. I may not want to sing your song. And to me, that was so profound because so often we always want people to be on our side to actually feel like we can um, accept them. And this, this refute, you know, this way of refuting it, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I mean, it, I can be a sellout and that's not, that's, that's my choice. And I also thought that that was really empowering also. And I think, this idea about e of equality um, that we are constantly in search of um, and always um, frustrated with inequality, but I, I think the road to progress is always under construction and, and 
who are we to assume that at any point we can rest on our laurels because um, things, all, you know, the 70 billion people who've lived before us have had all the struggles and it, sh it should be easy um, from now on. And so part of my curiosity, my, my quest for new ideas is the truth booth and this, the way in which the people, the, the thousands of people who've gone inside the booth are teachers. They force me to th see the world differently, but we also become like a, an incredible brain trust, um, all the people who collaborate with us. And I think hopefully a brain trust that can inspire the rest of us to actually think about our individuality and how it relates to our collective humanity. I also think about power and power of telling a story and framing a story, reusing images um, like this uh, picture of the slave book Brooks, the slave ship Brooks, um, turning it into a variation on the absolute, absolute ad campaign. For me, uh, I think a lot about um, blackness and like where does it come from? And I realized that the craziest, craziest thing about blackness is that quote unquote black people didn't create it, that Europeans with the commercial interest in having a subhuman brand created blackness. And when you take, think about Africa, which is this huge continent with hundreds of millions of people, with thousands of religions and cultures and worldviews, and people were kidnapped, packaged into ships and told they were all the same, um, shipped all the way around the world, across the world, and then 500 years later, we're still trying to figure out kind of who we are. To me, that's absolute power. This idea of taking hybridity and turning it into something that's monolithic, which we see in so many places and so many ways around our, our, our country. And I think about how slaves were branded as a si sign of ownership, and now today we brand ourselves through the phones we buy, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear. We're trying to tell people about how we want to be valued. And also thinking a lot about our own relationship to the, are, do we become slaves to the corporations that we are basically benefactors of because of our need um, for those seals of approval. And I think a lot about logos as our generation's hieroglyphs and how people who are celebrated now might be treated at a different period of time and how the logos are embedded with such incredible um, meaning and the meaning is almost always trying to lead us to buy something. What if those meanings could be led to tell other stories? Because we're all so media literate that we can actually take away and, and compute incredible amount of information in a little bit of time by looking at ads and thinking a lot about how even in morning we're still being marketed to. I, I started to think about advertising as the most powerful language in the world, but also this idea of the spectacle and especially black bodies as part of the spectacle and in lynchings in um, places not too far from here um, and how places not too far from here, even tonight, the descendants and the ancestors of um, people who were lynched um, are celebrated for the way that they, 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 they can be maybe hanging from a rim instead of a noose. And also thinking about how um, on many of the fields across the country, the descendants of sharecroppers are working for free on, uh, in, a, in a multi-billion dollar industry that's basically based around cotton. And I, I'm really interested in the past and the present and the ways in which we can look at and find new stories about the, pre the past and our future through critiquing uh, the ephemeral culture of the past because it's almost like when you look at these images, you get to um, put it, you're like in a time machine. So this is an ad from 100 years ago. It's, a, it's really propaganda when women in the United States were fighting for the right to vote. And I was kind of interested in how that story was being told and seeing images of quote unquote white women that are very similar to images that we see of quote unquote black people um, at the same time really forced me to question uh, this thing about equality and what happens, why we're so afraid of people getting what we have because we think that they're, they're gonna do what we did to them. I think, uh, and so I started to really think about this idea of voting especially that's just supposed to be in an inalienable right of, of an American citizen, but at the same time, so much is done to make sure that we do not vote. And a lot of the times that happens is through the divisions of demographics. Oh, those kind of people vote this way, those kind of people vote that way, and none of us can be deuced, deduced to demographic. Um, speaking of that, who, who knows who this is? 
Anybody? No? Coleman? Well, how about this? Shout out what you think this person did. 1915, same around, same time. What did he do for a living? Filmmaker, musician, lawyer, journalist, government. Well, um, he was a performer, um, and he performed blackness. This is Burt Williams, who was literally one of the most famous African-Americans of his generation. And I found it so fascinating the way that he performed, he was performed blackness off stage and how he was paid to perform blackness on stage and how this was one of the first African-American millionaires. And I think it was because he was so good at creating a story that people wanted to see around about people and how that affected future generations is pretty incredible. Uh, and so thinking about that context of African-Americans and Native Americans and most quote unquote uh, white women, and I say quote unquote because at the same time, most people we consider white today would not have been white. Russians, Germans, Polish, Irish, anybody who is Jewish, Italian, you know, so we also, Spanish, think about, have to think about how, how did they become white? And maybe it was because the numbers didn't support um, the, the agenda. But uh, th these images of this is what we're gonna do, this is what's gonna happen when women ha get the right to vote, really is so reflective of what happened today, uh, what's happening today. And I, I, then I start, so I started a project called Unbranded, A Century of White Women, when I started to look at ads from uh, across from, I took 101 ads from 1915 to 2015 and removed all the advertising information because I wanted to see what was being sold because once you remove the branding, you start to see other stories. This is an ad from 1955. Um, anyone want to guess what this is an ad for? Telephones. Well, it's actually an ad for, uh, yeah, a girdle uh, or corset. Um, and it said, come out of the bone age, darling. And that, um, so I guess part of being a modern woman would be to deform your body and let someone drag you <laughs> into, the, into the present. And what's so kind of ironic about this image, which was taking the same, it was, it was in print the same moment that Emmett Till was killed for allegedly whistling at a white woman. So it says a lot about who has the right to do what to whom. It's not, it's not about the dignity of the woman, it's about the, who can take away or that woman's dignity, but also think a lot about what happens, because this was a moment in 1960 when a lot of women were fighting to get to be on equal ground with, with men. And this ad to me says so much about how excited apparently men were for that. I found this in Esquire magazine. Um, what would you guess this is an ad for? You're good. <laughs> do you know what it said? It said, men are better than women. Indoors, women are useful, even pleasant. On a mountain, there's something of a drag, so don't go hauling them up a cliff to show off your new drum and climbing sweaters. No need to. Um, this is how you sell sweaters. Um, and literally, these guys are casually debating whether to let her fall to certain death or to pull her up. Um, and to me, that's an incredible metaphor. So I think we can learn a lot about by looking at the ads that our society produces because they say so much about our hopes and dreams and values and also about historical ones. And they can t say a lot about where we've been, also where we're going. And so as we, and, and what's also interesting that there's no one person that's responsible for them. We as a society are responsible for them. And I, and I think about how these narratives that are created through the ads and through popular culture shape the way that we see ourselves, the, see, the way we see one another. And it's, uh, and also, what, what else are we buying into when we buy a product based off of an image that, you know, under, after a closer look, might be a little bit questionable, to say, say the least. Also, I, I think a lot, I struggle with these surface identity readings. If this person is, is black, then I have to identify with them because I could identify with any number of people on any number of reasons, you know. Um, and an artist who, I, who made me think a lot about that is featured here. His name is Sanford Biggers, who, who's lived in, he's African-American, went to Morehouse, but he's lived in Poland and Japan and Italy. And a lot of his work is about hybridity. And so I, I, start, I took an image of a vaudeville character that I'd seen and kind of asked Sanford to, to kind of replay that and made this image where when you're looking at straight on, it's blurry. In order for you to see it clearly, you have to look at it from the side. And also thinking about my own 
quote unquote African American identity, I've often been asked, where do I come from? And I'll say New York. And then people say, well, what about before that? I'll say like Philadelphia. <laughs> and then what about before that, Virginia? Um, and somehow I don't give an efficient answer. And I realize, you know, a lot of ways I've never felt entirely home in the country I was born. And also when I go to the continent of Africa, I don't necessarily feel at home there. And so I created Africa, Africa America, a place to call home, just so that I could have, it, you know, where we are from is always in our head, right? It's the stories that we believe. So why don't we create our own? And I think a lot about this kind of shifting perspectives when I'm making work that, which is, I mean, I've heard that so many times this week. <laughs> it's all your fault, it's not my fault. Uh, I think this way in which we point fingers and take different perspectives um, based off of our own agenda forces me to ask a lot of questions like, after identity, what? You know, at what point do we stop telling ourselves that I have to be stuck in this position because of my identity and start to find newer avenues, uh, maybe intersectional ones, to, to create a, a broader coalition as that young um, boy was talking about at the end of the first clip that I saw. Because all of us, I think, are many people, depending on the clothes we're wearing and where we are, right? And unfortunately for many of us, kind of what we're wearing um, and the perception of that can be threatening to our health. This is an artist named Bayate Ross Smith who has done a lot of work about kind of our kind of people, you know, who we can relate to and how, how subjective and how uh, random it is, so to speak, and, and, um, really. Um, and, and also thinking about what the potency of saying I am, that for me it was amazing <laughs> when I made this piece t almost 10 years ago, well, I made a piece that was inspired by this photograph by Ernest Withers, where it says, uh, it's, as you can see, a, a number of men um, in Memphis, Tennessee, holding up signs that say, I am a man. Because the phrase I grew up with wasn't, I am a man, it was, I am the man. And I was really curious how it went from this collective statement under segregation to this kind of selfish statement under integration. And I wanted to rethink a lot about how when the Constitution was written, African Americans were counted as three-fifths of a human being. Um, so what does it mean when someone says, I'm a strict constitutionalist? Are you saying that, you know, I'm not a full person? That's just a question. I actually never asked anybody that. So if you have an answer, try it at the Q&A. Um, but I really, so I started remixing that and I started to think about the last line of this as a poem where it says, I'm the man, who's the man, you the man, what a man, I am man, I'm human, I'm many, I am, am I, I am, I am, I am, amen. Because I realized that the greatest gift that any of us are given is our consciousness, that that's um, who we are. And that the power of being able to say I am and whatever we say after that um, is so important because that defines how we think of ourselves. And I think a lot about that when I think about the greatest. You guys are pretty young, but do you know who the greatest is? Now, how many people here saw Muhammad Ali fight? Okay, you guys are in the strong minority. So what does it mean that a 22-year-old from little means in a segregated South could tell the world, I am the greatest? He didn't say I'm the greatest boxer. He just said I'm the greatest of all time. So, and from henceforward, forced himself in the world to see him that way, even after he's moved on, even after 30 years of watching him physically and, and some might say mentally degrade, he's still the greatest. So that's the power that we have to think about when we, act, you know, these affirmations, what we say about ourselves, what the stories we tell are so important because they affect the way other people see them. So I made a pen that's larger than life, like him, based off of that. It's the back of it. And I started really thinking about how statements like this one from Adam Clayton Powell, um, when we take a kitsch object and we call it art, it forces us to think about it and the world differently. And I then started really being looking deeper into the archive. This is an image I found in Life magazine in, uh, from 1965 in Watts. And I, I'm, I, so you can see as I reproduced it, I reproduced it as a mirror. So we see ourselves in it. And I think a lot about this image because the, the caption said, two little prisoners. Um, and I think a lot, like what happened, like the trauma of these boys who were seen as public enemy number one, apparently, 
And how did this image, be, why was it, you know, necessary? You know, what, what, were, what, what were they doing um, that put them in the, the, um, in the hands of the criminal justice system? And how did that affect the rest of their lives? And I think a lot about certain people being criminalized from before they even know who and what they are and how that shapes the rest of their lives. Thinking also about people who've lived a long time, like Amelia Boynton, who was in her 50s when she was attacked by police for trying to exercise her right to vote on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And what does it mean to be lived, you know, and even another 50 years, she died in 2015 at 109 years old. Um, but still with that same commitment and struggle and hope. Um, so I, I made a series of painting, a photographic kind of paintings where the mirrors um, with the photographs of Spider Martin um, because I wanted to see myself and viewers in these images. Obviously you can't see the reflection. This is John Lewis staring down the Alabama State Troopers who's now a congressman. Um, and so I, this reflecting on, uh, this is work from I think a few years ago, but and again I didn't know how relevant it might be. Um, and, but also thinking about how we can learn lessons from the past, about what does it mean to actually take for granted the things that people have fought so hard for, and thinking about this man who walked 50 miles on one foot um, because he believed black lives matter. Uh, this idea of not, being, not, not believing the hype that if it's not my group, I can't stand up for what I think is right. Uh, that inspiration um, which is also about leaders, but it's also about the people who hold us up. It's something that I'm thinking about because sometimes our leaders need to rest and sometimes they're gone. And also what happens when we be think of ourselves as decent people, um, but we, don't ha we have indecent thoughts. Um, that's what I think, uh, but maybe these people still feel the same way. Uh, or what happens when men hold hands in public? Um, what happens when you get arrested in apartheid South Africa, and you're not sure if anyone will ever see you again. And there's only one last chance to, to tell the world that to be strong. Um, I guess you put your arm through a breathing hole, not even knowing who's on the other side and what'll happen to it. Um, Amandla is the name of this piece where I started, I cropped basically that photograph that I made it in three dimensional space, because it seems so surreal to me for someone to put their arm through a hole not knowing if they'll ever be seen again if, or if anyone will ever see it or if that gesture will ever mean anything. They, that they were apparently speaking to us and I don't even know who, the, who they were. I started thinking a lot about the other people and how I could reframe photographs um, through the lens of fine art and take lessons from these collective movements where people stood together and resisted um, unjust governments. This is um, people burning their pass books which could lead to five years in jail. Also, in South Africa, another photograph was taken in, clan, in a clandestine way by Ernest Cole, who was classified as colored in South Africa, smuggled these photographs out and created a book, published a book called House of Bondage, which were the first images seen of apartheid South Africa, the horrors of it that America or no one, the world didn't know. And so also, so what does it mean when we take a photograph and we share it? Um, and what is the power of that? Um, to me, this image is hard to look at because I always found myself gawking at their butts. Um, and I felt it had to also be humiliating. And also, this is not a, an unfamiliar image even today. These are minors. So on, do you think, could we really think that the gold or the diamonds that we value and we have people who are getting paid pennies on the day? <laughs> or to, for, to pick up things from the earth, which should belong to all of us, <laughs> and that are more valuable to us than their lives. And if they steal it, they become criminals. To me, that's super profound. And I think a lot about how- It's six o'clock. It's six o'clock. <laughs> um, so you didn't even have to tell me that, Christine. <laughs> um, uh, I think a lot about um, how framing goes into that. So when I, I remade, I wanted to think about when I remade this piece, how would I remake it? And I cropped it at the shoulders and I titled it Raise Up because I wanted to imagine a different perspective on that image. 
and maybe one that was more hopeful. And then six months later, after I created this piece, the events in Ferguson, Missouri happened, and it was read in the United States as the hands up, don't shoot piece, which to me was incredible how something that was about something difficult or 50 years ago on the other part of the country, other part of the world, could speak so eloquently to something that's happening here and now. And that's what also, I, I learn a lot by looking at images and recontextualizing things that should never happen again, right, or should have never happened in the first place. We start to see through the cropping and the reviewing them about how they maybe are still happening and maybe happening even right here, not too far from, not too far from now. Uh, and so I, I start to, to really take these images also of, hope, of, of, of difficult times, but of hope, of like, um, you know, this is um, Berlin, 1989, when the people have had enough. Um, the walls that are built can be torn down uh, because, you know, what happens when we choose to come together? And, and so this reminds me of the Sistine Chapel, um, the creation image, but also how I have to remember the potency and the power of hope and coming together. Um, I think a lot about the magic that happens in sports as a metaphor for politics. And um, I was inspired by this picture of a Harlem Globetrotter. And I uh, asked a, a friend who uh, is known for being a Wolverine, uh, uh, Juwan Howard to let me cast his arm and created this piece called Liberty. Um, so he was one of the Fab Five and it was amazing to think about someone who was, um, yeah, what, what they did un unknowingly at such a young age um, and how it's not just about sports, it's about freedom, it's about opportunity, it's about overcoming and that we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that. But also this idea of coming, overcoming and breaking boundaries is part of what inspired the Truth Booth Project um, and thinking about the war that was happening in, in, uh, between Hezbollah and Israel in, 19, in 2006. Uh, I was at a residency with an Israeli and a Palestinian artist, Palestinian uh, Lebanese artist, and at the, when it happened, they went to opposite sides of every room. And then at the same, and it was about 20 artists from like 20 different countries. <laughs> and at some, it was also during the World Cup, so everyone was in a hyper-nationalist mood which was weird because they were talking, this is gonna be World War III, and everyone was like watching them, and it was like, is, it, is the World Cup more important or is this war more important? Um, and then at some point you started to see them huddled together, like talking, did you get any news? Did you hear this? Did you hear that? And it made me realize that there are more things that they had, in that case, they had more things in common than the rest of us did. And all of a sudden they were a community and we were, we, they were, you know, we were the them. And so I created this piece called, uh, where someone's, imagine someone screaming in, in Hebrew, the truth is I love you, and, and then someone on the opposite side of the wall screaming uh, in Arabic, the truth is I am you. Wait, other way around. One says the truth is I am you, one says the truth is I love you. And all they hear is someone else screaming. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, to imagine kind of how do you send messages across borders and boundaries, and so the truth booth was an opportunity to do that. So we took it um, to so many places, this is, um, from New York and Russell Simmons. The truth is there are 500,000 people locked up in jail because they can't afford minimal bail. That's an unequal justice system. And so what happens in the truth poop is people just, everyone becomes an expert. It, you walk in and uh, there's a touchscreen inviting you to share the truth from your perspective. And we were first excited to get our first grant from Laura Mott, thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess you owe me because it took 10 years of my life. Um, um, but it's funny, so be careful if you get a grant. How much was that grant for, Laura? It was for $10,000 for 10 years? <laughs> I was, that was a lot of money. <laughs> um, for, but when you split it three ways over five continents, it <laughs> doesn't go so far. But she gave us this opportunity of saying like, okay, you have this idea of going around the country and getting people's truths, and then we had the responsibility of trying to make it a reality. And so, so kind of it beginning and, and ending with, with, with Laura's work and faith was super exciting. But the first place we were actually able to take it, myself, Jim, and Ryan, was Ireland, which has got this tradition of um, a, 
of confession, right, as a Catholic country. And so it was, it's amazing just to see some of the truths we got there. The truth is I am a tomboy, and I hate pink, and I hate princesses. That's the truth. She just amazed me because how, again, how is she so aware of what's supposed to be her and then, you know, who she is in response to that. But then there, was, there were young people, but then there were older people who had incredible wisdom. The truth is not to be discovered because it was there before we were born. It hid itself when we were born and it only comes out again once we are dead. I'm nearly dead, so the truth will shortly emerge. I believe the truth is the struggle to find what it really is. The truth is really small, it's very hard to see, but if you look really, really close, you will find the truth, and it's all around. Thank you. It is true that I have got a girlfriend that is named Rian, and it is true that my favorite animal is a dolphin, okay? And that's all I wanted to say. The truth is, Molly, you're a bitch. The truth is, that I want to be an actor, a dancer, a singer, but I'm not sure how to get into the business. I've joined Trading Faces, and well, I've joined the agency of there, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get into the, well, I am in the agency, I'm not sure if I'm going to get anything out of it. And I just really want to be an actress, especially, or maybe a beautician, or a singer, maybe, or maybe a dancer, but I'm not sure how to get in. That's the truth. This was an Axel and Keen production. Let's say hello to Melody because she's my little doggy and all my other pets and my parents. Peace out. The truth, I believe, is Lego. Lego brings you think small, but believe big. Lego is in all our minds. So the truth is very, very small, but think big. This is very cute. I mean, again, that little boy just blew my mind. I mean, the fact that, like, we see, you know, we, we're taught as young people not to judge a book by its cover, and then we go about being taught to judge everyone by their cover. And I realized through projects like this um, how much every single person has to offer me if I'm giving them opportunity and willing to listen. And so Jim and Ryan took it to Afghanistan. Uh, there are incredible truths from there. We took it to Miami, took it to a presidential debate. Um, took it all over Cleveland, and we also took it to New York in 2015. Here's a few clips from there. Um, the truth is that yesterday I came out to my mother um, as being somebody who is fluid in their sexuality, um, and that was a really scary thing. Um, so I think that the truth is that we need to be more accepting of people for who they are and the ways that they are um, and yeah the truth is love is love and that's all that matters well um, the truth is actually my truth is kind of sad um, I've had three miscarriages and actually one of them was a stillborn baby my son um, and I guess my truth is that I don't want to try anymore People are always hopeful, people that know my story, people that know me always say, don't worry about it, it'll happen. But you know what, that's not my path. So my truth is that I just hope people stop asking me because I'm good with it, okay? The truth is, I don't think we need a cure for autism. I am an autistic child, so, and I know what it's like to be an autistic, but many people sometimes don't recognize that. I got a great education at a special needs school and I feel as if I'm like other kids and only to find autistic because of my history in the past. The truth is is that I never look at myself in the mirror because 
I get depressed about it because I feel like I'm so ugly. And even if I'm in yoga, I'll just try to avoid the mirror. And if I'm washing my hands in a public bathroom, I'll just avoid the mirror. And I thought, don't touch that, Quincy. I thought maybe that if I said this out loud into a camera, there might be other people here who never like to look in the mirror either because I've never told anyone that and I figure this is a place to tell your secret. The truth is, I've tried to end my life five times <laughs> and every time I don't succeed, I feel better about myself and I've overcome it and I don't wish I was dead anymore and that's the truth. And I'm happy that I'm a bigger person now. Um, yeah, what do you say after that? Uh, for us, part of the thing that was difficult was, I mean, the curious is that she just didn't know where the camera was because she couldn't see herself, but she came up to the camera in such a way that her identity is completely anonymous, but she also left an incredible message. Uh, and we, I thought was a sad message because she's crying what she's saying, but Will, Sylvester, who's one of my collaborators, saw it differently, which is also the value of collaboration, is that th through the tug of war of disagreeing, you start to learn new things. And he was saying that um, he saw her as saying, like, I've, I, I've struggled a lot. Um, and through every time I overcome a struggle, I become stronger and better. And I really am proud of myself. And that's an aspirational and inspirational message. Um, and I think that's also a really important thing to think about the truth is how what I hear and see is different. We can look at the same thing and see something differently. Or that woman who says that the truth is I think I'm ugly. And then in the middle of it, all of a sudden her kid's there. So someone didn't think she was ugly. Um, so it's also about the perspectives we have on our reality and our truth. So to me, this project is so much more interesting than anything else I do because I'm not in control. I'm just kind of like, we created this platform and I, I hope that you guys go to Cranbrook to see um, the, the truths, some of the truths that we got in this incredible installation um, because it's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. People are so wonderful. Everyone is beautiful. Um, everything, everyone is interesting. And uh, I try to, sh to touch in other ways through public installations like this one that Ryan and I did um, in New York. Uh, this says the truth is I need you in German. Is that true? Okay, good. Because we had to translate it, and every time we asked someone to translate, they were like, no, that's not how you say it. That's, you know, we realize even it's so content, translation's contentious. Who you're, the people are like, you know, in certain languages, the truth is not a word. <laughs> in certain languages, you is dependent upon who you're speaking to. Uh, but in this installation, you walk down um, the street, and, and there's a sign that says, the truth is I reflect you, the truth is I accept you, and on the other side, it'll say something in another language. Anybody speak Vietnamese? What's it say? No. Um, but so, so, so all of a sudden you become, the people standing under the signs become part of the collaboration, part of the, the installation, and then we made these benches. Um, one of them is, is here, and I know it's in Flint. Um, at the Mott Borscht collection. Um, but the people who sit in the bench become actually, um, actually parts of the sculpture. And, and I love this idea of a sculpture that is only activated and only really has meaning when people are in it or a part of it. And then there's a sign, that the, a tree that says, as you walk around it, the truth is I love you, which is true about how I feel about you all. I've never given a talk in front of more beautiful people. Um, <laughs> It's not that I can't see you, <laughs> um, but that's how I feel. Um, and that led me to think about this, um, these projects, ha what kind of other platforms can we create? And Four Freedoms, which is the last project I'll talk about, uh, was created by myself and Eric Gottesman, who are, so this is some of Eric's work, which is, a lot of it was in Ethiopia, but it's also asking the public to engage um, and thinking about the systems of control um, and what happens when we raise our voices, but what happens if we're not raising our voice in protest, but we're actually using the system as our voice. So we created a super PAC, which is a political action committee created, inspired by uh, Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, which were translated into art by Norman Rockwell, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and the most curious one to me, freedom from want. 
this idea of uh, these things that are the foundation of the argument for human rights that he laid out. What does it mean to be, uh, what do those four freedoms mean in the 21st century? These, ironically, were also the same signs that were uh, used to get, enlist people to go to war and invest in war. Um, buy, you know, buy war bonds, save freedom of worship. Um, and so myself and Eric and Joanna Bellarado Samuels, Michelle Wu, and Wyatt Gallery created, the, wanted to see as, could we as artists function as political operatives? So we turned my gallery in Chelsea, Jack Shaman, into our, our office for uh, two months last summer and asked a number of artists not to donate work, but to artists who were doing any number of political things to actually present work in the context of a political, um, a, a politi politi in context of political speech. So um, what, what does that look like? By there's artists who, were, who were, did food, there's artists who asked people to write letters, and then we started to make these signs, and we'd give them to people, um, lawn signs, and also seeing what different people say um, when they write, have the opportunity to fill out their own lawn signs. Uh, we did town halls uh, with artists named like Dred Scott, um, someone who was convicted of murder and spent 21 years of his life, um, sp spoke about t his 10 years in um, solitary confinement, but also what it means to like, he had just gotten out. He, he was our scholar in residence for about, um, all throughout the whole summer. But also, how, so how do we um, look at art in a political landscape and then what happens when it leaves the gallery um, and give, goes back into the hands of individuals and then we can make these, that who become again part of the art project. And then we started to do events like at Afropunk in New York, um, and we did in Atlanta and Cleveland, LA. Uh, we did bus stops in Chicago and ads in magazines. And this one got censored a lot. Anybody wonder why the vagina is actually seen as obscene? It's every, the majority of the human population has one, and none of us would be here without one. How is that obscene? What does it mean that like literally where we came from is seen as something that we should be ashamed of? Um, which is something um, that Marilyn Minter deals with a lot. I'm still like, I'm like, why am I shivering? I mean, it's literally the first thing I might have ever seen. <laughs> you know? um, but so we made these signs. Uh, we made, we did, we did like a, we put, we did, we made, a, what do you call that thing? A mobile billboard. We put those out in the public. Um, took to, 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 to rallies, that was a Trump rally, obviously, um, and then asked artists to make political speech and did billboards, you know, with Democracy in the, democracy in the Balance, There's Only One Choice, Carrie Mae Weems. Um, we did, we this, had this one in Flint. Um, I guess, you know, that didn't really work. Um, but we also didn't choose a side, because I think choosing a side forces us to actually not think more critically because I don't think there is one side. There's only one. There is only one side, not this side or that side. And that, that the side is the side of us who are moving forward because we actually can't go backwards. That's how physics and time work. Um, so what does it mean to make America great again um, in the in the 21st century? When was America greater for more people than it is today? Is the real important question for me. And I, I don't think there there is one. And if I had to say that. Um, I thought it would have to be that period where people like John Lewis, who was more than just talk, um, actually stood up courageously and lovingly against, you know, a sea of hatred and proved to us and to the people who were trying to hold them back um, that love overrules. And so this, this idea of imagining a future that we want to live in is so central to everything that I, I, I want to do because I don't want to be that person who actually is audacious enough to think that my life is more important than anyone else's and that my story or what I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes. So why am I going to fret about the future when I have right now? And I think we all can collectively build the future that we want to have and not necessarily be um, living in the shame and the fear that we've been conditioned to actually believe because the same people who told me who was going to be president are now telling me why that per person was president. And I'm like, maybe I should have just been listening to myself instead of trying to like believe the hype, as Public Enemy said in 1988. So why don't we create our own hype is what Four Freedoms is about and really trying to spread that message that they are us and us is them and that rather than really trying to um, divide that there, we all have more things in common than we do that separates us. And so um, I am done. 
and um, we'll hope that you guys will come, if you don't have class, to the Q&A.